Dr. Anselm John in the presenting seminar. Um, Anselm has uh, worked in general for a number of years. He obtained his PhD at BKZN in 2012. He then did postdoc at BKZN and NITEP in Stellenbosch, and he joined the uh, department as a lecturer in 2017. I'm um, pleased to ask him to present him in our viscous fluids in cosmology. Thank you, Nigel. Okay, good morning and welcome to my seminar. I'll be presenting a talk on viscous fluids and cosmology. I'm Anselm John from Rhodes University, as Professor Bishop has indicated. And uh, without further ado, let me give you an outline of my talk. So I'm not going to assume any knowledge of relativity or cosmology from the audience. Uh, what I'm going to do is start with some classical fluid <laughs> mechanics, look at how it can be extended to general relativity. Then I'll discuss precipitative fluid mechanics and um, look at how that can be incorporated in both the classical and the relativistic versions. I'll then go on to look at why viscosity is important in cosmology. I'll then focus on the problem of structure formation, which is an area that I work on, and how viscosity uh, plays an important role in addressing the problems there. And I'll then go on to conclude and state some references. Okay. Okay, so fluid mechanics falls squarely into the branch of science known as continuum mechanics. Uh, that is a macroscopic classical description of continuous of a continuous system where each volume element contains a large number of particles. Uh, so this includes the study of both solids and fluids. So we're looking at uh, macroscopic systems where we can average things out uh, without being interested in the individual particles and elements that go into these systems. Fluid mechanics is a study of continuous media that cannot support shear stresses in static equilibrium. Unlike solids, fluids deform continually, and liquids and gases are examples of fluids. And a key distinction between liquids and fluids is that liquids can form free surfaces, while gases tend to diffuse. Uh, I'm using a very heuristic definition here. I'm not giving an entire course, uh, but a seminar. Um, so these definitions might be a bit uh, on the hand wavy side. Uh, fluid mechanics has a large number of applications, and it's been successfully used to model systems that occur in astrophysics and cosmology, as well as geophysics, oceanography, and plasma physics. I should point out that magnetohydrodynamics is an incredibly successful subject, and that essentially is the fluid description of systems containing plasma. So that was, um, that was an area which fluid description turned out to be quite useful and developed into a subject of its own right. So fluid mechanics has got a very rich history and a very wide range of applicability. And in my seminar, I'm going to look at fluids and in particular viscous fluids and see how they're used in cosmology. Okay, so the fundamental equations of fluid mechanics are a system of coupled nonlinear partial differential equations. And these were developed over the last few centuries by some of the most famous people um, in the field, um, people like goes all the way back to Newton and Euler, includes Bernoulli, Navier Stokes, amongst many others. And the fundamental equations are essentially a statement of conservation laws. The most basic one is the conservation of mass, and mass conservation <laughs> is governed by equation one, often called the continuity equation, where rho represents the mass density, mass per unit volume of the fluid element, and u is the fluid velocity. I'll use pole space to indicate vector quantities. Now, the continuity equation can be rewritten if one, instead of using partial derivatives, one uses what's known as the material or the substantial derivative, also known as the Stokes derivative. It has a, a large number of names, but the idea is that this is a derivative that follows a fluid element along the a flow line. And so using this material derivative, the continuity equation can be written in the form of equation two. And that immediately tells us that if the fluid has a constant density or is incompressible, then that is equivalent to requiring 
that the divergence of its velocity vanishes. So that's where that often stated incompressibility condition comes from. And it's much more transparent when looking at equation two. Okay, so that's the conservation of mass. We have two more fundamental conservation laws. First is the conservation of momentum, okay, given by equation three. And one way to think of this is as Newton's second law of motion for fluids. So that's just the old F equals MA. On the left-hand side, you've got a, a mass density or a mass per unit volume. The material derivative acts on, a, on the velocity to produce an acceleration. So the left-hand side is really just a, a mass times acceleration per unit volume. And whatever's sitting on the right-hand side are the forces um, acting on the fluid that accelerate it. Now, there are broadly two kinds of forces that can act on a fluid. Forces that act across the surface appear as pressure gradients, and those are the grad P terms, while forces that act throughout an entire volume element appear as body forces. And I've listed rho grad phi as an example of one. And the particular example I've used, the body force here is caused by the acceleration of the fluid by gravitational potential phi. Now, this gravitational potential could be an external potential. So, for instance, if you're describing accretion onto a, a black hole or a neutron star, that potential is just the old uh, GM over R. Um, but if the fluid is self-gravitating, when the gravity of the of fluid particles can no longer be ignored, um, then that grad phi will be determined internally. Uh, and so you would complete the system with something like Poisson's equation. Okay, the last conservation law is energy conservation. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated form. Um, here I'm going to use the small letter E, um, as is customary to indicate quantities that are defined per unit mass with small letters. So that small letter E is the internal energy per unit mass. Uh, and we've got this stress tensor, this tau ij, so that's a stress tensor. Um, <clears throat> and that, for a perfect fluid, is given by equation five, so it's just a diagonal uh, tensor where the diagonal elements are given by the pressure of the fluid. That delta ij is just a Kronecker delta. The indices i and j run over spatial coordinates, so those will run from one to three. Okay, and the last term in that equation is this divergence of kappa times the temperature gradient. Uh, that comes from Fourier's law of induction, which gives us the heat flux Q in terms of the thermal conductivity and the temperature gradient. So um, conservation of energy for a fluid uh, is governed by equation four. Okay, so we have alternative form for the energy conservation law. Um, instead of using equation four, it's often convenient to use equation six, which looks quite similar. Here, the fundamental variable is the specific enthalpy H, uh, which is given by the uh, expression seven, E plus P over O. And the enthalpy is an indication of the thermodynamic energy available with heat, the heat substance. Okay, so this enthalpy form of the energy law is very useful when you have um, dissipative systems. So forms six and five, six and four are commonly used. Uh, and again, this term with the divergence of the temperature gradient appears, and so Fourier's law has been invoked as well. Uh, both forms of the energy conservation law were derived from the mass and momentum conservation laws that we saw earlier, as well as the first law of thermodynamics. So there's quite a lot of physics that goes into these expressions uh, that were developed uh, uh, over the course of a couple of centuries. And finally, we have the equation of state. Um, this arises from microphysics and, in general, relates the pressure of a fluid to its energy and entropy density, density indicated by S. Perfect fluids are very special cases where the 
equation of state is this form where the pressure is purely a function of the, of the density. And there are some very familiar examples of equations of state that we've known about. Uh, the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, a uh, slightly more sophisticated version, the van der Waals equation of state. Um, in cosmology and astrophysics, fairly popular equations of state, ones that have turned out to be quite useful, include the linear equation of state, where W is a constant, um, and this covers the cases of uh, pressure-free dust, as well as radiation. Uh, could also include the cosmological constant, when that W is negative, uh, negative one. And then we have the polytrope equation of state, where the pressure depends on the density to power gamma, where gamma is the ratio of specific heat. So that's a very popular model in, uh, that's a very popular equation of state in any models of stellar structure. Okay, so these are examples of some equations of state. They can become quite complicated. In particular, if you look at the interior of neutron stars, uh, there the situation is we're considering nuclear physics at extremely high densities. And so the equations of state uh, are um, inaccessible from ordinary laboratory experiments. And a variety of equations of state have been proposed and they're much more complicated than these simple forms that have indicated here. Uh, but for cosmology, uh, the sorts of objects that one looks at, fairly simple equations of state uh, have quite a lot of description power. Okay, so just to summarize what have happened, what I'm going to call the Navier-Stokes system consists of the following three conservation laws, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. If fluid is self-gravitating, that gravitational potential phi is determined by the density of the fluid, the mass density, and so the system is completed by Poisson's equation, uh, as well as the equation of state. So in a typical fluid mechanics problem, the unknowns that you're interested in solving for are the pressure, the mass density, uh, the energy density, and the velocity. So that is essentially classical fluid mechanics and the governing equations. If you have to look at this as a purely mathematical problem, it's a system of coupled nonlinear PEs. Uh, there are many existence and stability results that are uh, um, still lying wait. Um, so um, this is an incredibly complicated system, both mathematically and incredibly powerful system physically. Okay, so those are what I'll call the Navier-Stokes equations. And for now, I've not looked at any energy loss. Uh, this is a purely, um, these are purely perfect fluids. Okay, so now I'm going to look at systems that are not perfect and systems that contain viscosity. Now, viscosity, one can define as the resistance of a fluid to deformation. And there are two types of viscosity. If you look at the classic text by Landau and Lipschitz on uh, fluid mechanics, uh, it's more of a classic series. This is an example of one of the, the classic books in that series. Um, they argue for bulk viscosity uh, by stating that when fluids deviate from fluid equilibrium during rapid compressions or expansions, uh, the system has to return to fluid equilibrium uh, and it gets driven towards fluid equilibrium by some internal processes. If these processes or relaxation uh, mechanisms uh, are quite slow compared to other timescales in your system, then you could experience energy loss in your system. And when that happens, uh, your fluid is said to exhibit bulk viscosity. Uh, what is much more common in, in many systems is shear viscosity. And that occurs whenever you have a velocity gradient in your, in your system. And um, when these velocity gradients show up, <coughs> shear stresses get experienced by the fluid. And shear viscosity is a measure of uh, the coupling of layers of these fluids by internal friction. So um, ideal gases and perfect fluids do not have any uh, viscosity, uh, but most real fluids will exhibit one or, one or the other of these uh, types of viscosity. So we're going to be looking at this and how they show up in cosmology. Okay, so 
having uh, introduced um, the concept of viscosity, we need to model it. So we want to incorporate these dissipative processes into our conservation laws. Now, quite conveniently, mass conservation is completely unaltered by these dissipative processes. So the continuity equation uh, will be the same regardless of whether or not there's a uh, problem with shear viscosity. But our stress tensor becomes modified. So earlier I'd introduced this tau as the stress tensor, uh, which has this isotropic pressure acting along the diagonal. But I'm now going to augment it with this tau prime, which is the viscous stress tensor. And that you can see depends on velocity. So it's a divergence of the velocity here and a, and a gradient, velocity gradients here. There are these two coefficients, lambda and mu. They have uh, been called, labeled various other things. Uh, lambda and mu correspond to the coefficients of bulk and shear viscosity. Those are often found empirically or modeled theoretically, and these are usually temperature dependent. So the viscosity of the fluid will vary depending on its temperature. Okay, so the stress tensor has been modified. So how does it affect momentum conservation? Well, that looks very similar to the old momentum conservation law. Remember, our left-hand side is just our mass times acceleration. You have pressure gradients acting here, your surface forces. You have your bulk or body forces acting here. Uh, but you also need this gradient of the um, rather this divergence viscous stress. So explicitly writing tau prime in terms of bulk and shear viscosity, the conservation law for momentum in a fluid with viscosity has the form of equation 16. So you can see it's really starting to become quite nasty. What about energy conservation? Okay, well, as with the perfect fluid case, we can write two forms for energy conservation, the energy form and the enthalpy form. These are equivalent. And in the first case, the energy conservation law looks formally very similar to the old energy conservation law for a perfect fluid, except here the stress tensor tau is the full stress tensor. It, it includes the, the viscous stress tensor. When I write energy conservation in enthalpy form, uh, it looks like equation 18, and there you can see the viscous stress tensor explicitly appearing here. Okay, so when tau prime is zero, we will recover the old results of classical uh, hydrodynamics. Okay, so that's how you model viscosity in, in classical fluid mechanics. Okay, so why would you need to go through a relativistic formulation? Okay, so the Navier-Stokes equations only apply to macroscopic systems with very low velocities, so where, where B is going to be much smaller than C. Of light. And when gravity is included in the traditional hydrodynamics equations, it's purely Newtonian. So your system can be closed with Poisson's law, for example. Uh, and we know that Newtonian gravity is inadequate uh, and very large densities. So relativistic effects are going to become important when fluids experience very large velocities, very high densities, and very strong gravitational fields. Whether these are gravitational fields induced by the fluid themselves, or simply um, fields due to the environment these fluids find themselves in. Okay, and you'd want to use a hydrodynamic description because it still remains useful even at these high nuclear densities that occur in neutron stars, quark gluon plasmas, the early universe, accretion disks, and jets. So there's a wide range of systems in which hydrodynamics is incredibly useful <coughs> and a good description. Uh, but where relativistic effects cannot be ignored. So in the sorts of systems that I've just described here, uh, both spatial and general relativity have to be incorporated. So there's already a strong motivation for including relativity and hydrodynamics. Uh, and this certainly became important in the 1960s where astronomers started to discover things like neutron stars, pulsars, uh, quasars, and the like, um, systems that uh, had to be described relativistically. Okay, so that's the motivation for 
typical relativistic formulation of the Navy Stokes equation. And it turns out uh, that this is fairly easy to do. Um, and the Navier Stokes equations can be formulated very naturally in special or general relativity. Okay, so remember the Navier Stokes equations were just conservation laws. Mass conservation uh, can be written in the form of equation 19. Uh, here, rho is the rest mass density, and u mu is the fluid flow velocity. Now, because we're looking at relativistic systems, um, we have to treat time and space uh, on equal footing. And so this index mu in this vector runs from 0 to 3. I'll largely use the convention, and I hope that I've stuck to it, having the Greek letters run from 0 to 3, so these are the space time coordinates. Uh, so equation 19 is this very compact form of the um, conservation of, of rest mass. So I've got this nabla mu sitting in equation 19. And what that is, is the covariant derivative, and that's a concept from differential geometry. Uh, in essence, it's a curved space-time generalization of the partial derivative. You need to take into account the fact that your space-times or your manifolds are, are curved. So the notion of a partial derivative gets generalized here, and this connection gamma incorporates the metric and its derivatives. I'm not going to say too much about it, uh, but the point is that one needs to one needs to count the curvature of your space when one looks at relativistic systems. Okay, so okay, that is. A, I have a photograph here um, on the right hand side. I think this version of Acrobat does the image that I filed in my laptop. Okay. Okay, so um, conservation laws can actually be written as the vanishing of order version. So we'll have this form of a contraction, nabla mu, j mu equals zero. And the stress tensor for perfect fluid in relativity is written in this form. You can see there's a pressure and there's a metric instead of the Olkronika delta. Uh, but of course, the energy density epsilon now plays a role. Okay. So these indices, alpha and beta, will run from 0 to 3. 0 is time. 1, 2, and 3 are the three spatial coordinates. So one can very naturally extend the old Cauchy stress tensor to a relativistic system. And here, um, conservation of energy momentum simply follows from the vanishing of the four divergence of the stress tensor. So you're getting both of the old conservation laws in this very nice and compact equation. Um, uh, for those of you who are wondering what was here, I had a picture of a, a very nice bottle of wine that had the stress tensor for perfect fluid as its label. So clearly the makers of, uh, of this bottle uh, had supreme confidence in their particular uh, wine. Uh, alas, uh, it's not to be seen. Okay, so if you have perfect fluid and curved space-time, it obeys the energy conservation law, given by equation 20, and the momentum conservation law, given by equation 21. Uh, there are a couple of symbols here which aren't that crucial. This tensor H is a projection tensor, and I've just used some notation where these dots indicate contractions of these scalars with fluid velocity, and this U mu dot can be thought of as a relativistic version of the material derivative. You see this contraction of velocity with the, uh, with the gradient. In this case, it's, it's the full covariant derivative. Okay, so the conservation laws uh, incorporate space-time curvature, and they written like this. They look very similar to their classic versions. Okay, so we now have seen how to do hydrodynamics in relativity, but can we do dissipative hydrodynamics in relativity? Okay. So this subject goes back to Eckhart back in 1940, and he proposed the following stress tensor, which looks a lot like 
the stress can see here, except now the pressure has got this extra term pi, which is the bulk viscous pressure. And Echo proposed that the bulk viscous pressure obeys this relation, 23, where zeta is what he uses for the uh, coefficient of bulk viscosity. So that's the old Eckhart model. Um, and the conservation laws simply follow from taking the diversions of the stress cancer. Um, it's based on first order deviations from thermal equilibrium. Uh, the Eckhart model is quite useful. It's been used to model many systems. Uh, however, it does violate causality and it admits superliminal propagation of signals. So while this might appear to be a very good relativistic uh, theory of precipitative hydrodynamics, uh, it has a number of problems. If you're looking at any relativistic system, you have to respect causality. So it's been out for quite some time that the Eckhart problem had some, some serious shortcomings. There were some attempts to improve upon this. Um, Muller in 1967 and Israel and Stewart independently in the 1970s developed a second order theory of viscosity. And there, their stress tensor uh, is the same as what Eckhart proposed. So you have this bulk viscous pressure sitting uh, here. But the bulk viscosity now obeys a transport equation. It has this fairly complicated looking form, equation 25. So you can see uh, these dots are time derivatives. So there's an evolution equation for the bulk viscous pressure. Uh, and so you expect precipitative processes to occur at the finite time periods. Uh, this is a fairly complicated looking transport equation. People have looked at truncating this, uh, look at, looked at situations where the right hand side vanishes, uh, and then you get what is known as the truncated Israel Stewart theory. Uh, which just consists of uh, these three terms. And of course, the Israel Stewart also does contain the echo theory. Uh, if you look at the limit where this relaxation time tau zero, then you just have these two terms with the bulk viscous pressure is given by this whatever. Okay, so that's the Israel Stewart theory. It's also quite popular. Um, unfortunately, its causal structure isn't fully known. This is a long-standing problem. It's not clear, clear whether um, the system does respect uh, uh, causality. Okay, so you can see there are a number of proposals, and it's not, uh, it's certainly far from a closed subject uh, as to how to formulate dissipative hydrodynamics in relativity. Quite recently, Disconzi uh, proposed yet another uh, formulation of dissipative hydrodynamics. Again, the stress tensor has the same form. Uh, and your bulk viscous pressure looks a lot like that given by the Eckhart theory. Except here, Disconzi explicitly includes the specific enthalpy of the fluid uh, in front of the velocity. Uh, Disconzi's work was inspired by earlier work by Lichnerovich in the 1960s, and this H times U can be interpreted as a relativistic generalization of the fluid velocity. So this is quite a recent model, and I've been doing some work on this with, uh, uh, with my collaborator. Okay, so that's viscosity, and this is all quite formal, um, and relativistic versions of viscosity. But why would you want to look at viscosity in cosmology? Well, this is a subject with a, a that's fairly well established. Uh, back in the 1970s, Murphy introduced bulk viscous pressure as a way to resolve the singularity problem. So in cosmology, we have this unavoidable singularity at the beginning of time, at the old uh, beginning of the expansion of the universe. Uh, and bulk viscosity might provide us with a way to uh, avoid uh, an initial singularity. Uh, particle creation in strong gravitational fields can also be described using bulk viscosity. Bulk viscous pressure also reduces the effective total pressure of fluid, uh, and by reducing uh, pressure, one can also make it negative. Uh, negative pressures, or rather negative equations of state parameters, are important mechanisms for driving accelerated expansion. So that's important both in the early universe 
when we expect inflation to happen, and both in the very late universe, when we have this phenomenon of dark energy. Okay, so bulk viscosity can very naturally account for many of these phenomena and cosmology. If you look at structure formation, which is an area I work on, uh, viscosity dissipates energy and momentum and plays a role in the growth of inoperability. So large scale structure, which consists of dark matter, uh, will grow uh, will grow in a way that is affected by loss of energy. So viscosity if it does occur in dark matter will certainly influence the formation of large scale structures as well as its evolution. And it will also play a role in much smaller <coughs> systems like compact stellar objects. Okay, so there's quite a lot of scope for looking at dissipative processes uh, in cosmology and in astrophysics. So, so far I've just been talking about bulk viscosity. Uh, shear viscosity has traditionally not been considered in cosmology, uh, and that's because the moment you have any sort of shear viscosity, you violate the large scale homogeneity and isotropy. So, that's a, a fairly well established observational fact that. There are very large scales. There are no preferred positions or points in the universe, as well as no preferred directions. And as soon as you have shear, um, you'll still have preferred directions. Okay. If any shear viscosity occurs in the universe, it's in very small scales. Um, having said that, shear viscosity can become significant during the later non-linear stages of structure formation. So it can't always be ignored. So very recently, people started to shift viscosity, and that's also the area of time. Okay, so I'm going to very, very quickly give us a a, a top-down picture of what structure formation is. What I mean by this: uh, so the universe is approximately 14 billion years old, and in its infancy, uh, it was incredibly hot, smooth, and dense. So this is an image of the uh, temperature fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. And you can see that's incredibly smooth. And the structures occur on these very small scales. And over the course of its, of its history, the universe went from looking like this to looking like this. Very cool, very heterogeneous, and very different. And understanding how we the universe evolved from this picture to this picture uh, is the main question of subject of structure formation. Okay, so the main mechanism driving the formation of these large structures is the gravitational instability paradigm. Uh, this is based on the old genes instability. So if you look at a fluid that is self-gravitating and exhibits pressure, there's competition between these two forces. The self-gravity wants to collapse everything at the point, whereas the fluid pressure is going to push everything outwards. So, uh, in general, this fluid will exist in a state of hydrostatic equilibrium, where these two forces are exactly balanced, uh, but this equilibrium might not be stable. Okay, so the gene instability shows up whenever uh, this condition is satisfied, whenever the wave numbers are below this value, which is determined by the density of the fluid, as well as its sound speed. Any density perturbation, so if I perturb the system, if I make part of it slightly more dense than the rest, uh, if these density perturbations generate waves where the wavelengths are, um, are larger than the so-called Jung scale, lambda j, uh, then they will become stable, they'll grow exponentially. Equivalent wave is that if you look at the over densities where the closed masses are above the genes mass here, those will become unstable. So there's a there's a fundamental limit uh, as to how much mass you can compress into a volume before it starts to become unstable. Okay, so that's the main idea of the genes instability. Uh, this goes back to the beginning of the 20th century by Sir James Genes, and this was looked at in a purely non cosmological setting. So applying this to an expanding universe, uh, gene instability would work if one could sort of the universe to consist purely of baryonic or normal matter, the stuff that appears in the periodic table. Uh, 
But if the universe was purely baryonic, it is far too young to have produced the full structures we see today. Okay, there's not enough time to grow these galaxies uh, that will appear in these films. This is a simulation uh, of dark matter. Um, uh, piece of it's here. So structure formation provides yet another piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter. And so we need large amounts of dark matter in order to structure formation to work. Okay, so the structure formation scenario is quite successful. Uh, it accounts for the current distribution of galaxies uh, in the universe. However, there are a number of persistent discrepancies between what our simulations produce and what our astronomers observe. Um, and there's a very nice summary in this paper by Del Popolo and Le Delio. Uh, and these problems have been collectively termed the small scale crisis in cosmology. Uh, there's always a crisis or a tension in cosmology, and it's the sign of a, of a healthy subject that there's always uh, some sort of discrepancy between observations. So it certainly means there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so don't panic when people tell you about crises or tensions in, in cosmology. It just means there's a lot of work to be done. Um, okay. So these. The small scale crisis includes a number of problems, and I've just highlighted two of them. One is the missing satellites <laughs> problem. Uh, so the galaxies that appear in these simulations have far too many satellite galaxies compared to what we see. Um, there's also the cusp core problem, where these where dwarf galaxies have density profiles that are much flatter at the center uh, uh, than the simulations predict. Um, so what's common to these sorts of problems is that they appear to they appear on these small scales, where our models and our theories seem to predict an excess of structure on very small scales. Um, a couple of solutions have been proposed to this. One is um, having warm dark matter, so things like neutrinos. Uh, if they comprise fractions of dark matter, those could smooth out structure on smaller scales. A fairly radical proposal is to modify gravity, change our law of gravity, extending extending general relativity. Uh, that could work. Uh, a more modest proposal is to include precipitative phenomena, so including viscosity, uh, and that's the sort of work I've done with my collaborators at Woody and Opinion, uh, outlined in this paper here. And I will, uh, for the rest of this talk, describe that result. Okay, so viscosity could possibly address the structure formation problems. It's usually been modeled by the Eckhart theory, uh, but as I've said earlier, the Eckhart theory has problems with causality. Uh, the Israel Stewart theory seems to avoid pathology, although that question has not been settled. Uh, the first study of structure formation using causal viscosity, the Eckhart theory, uh, uh, was done uh, uh, in this paper. Sort of describe here. So our model is quite simple. Um, I'm not going to use general relativity at all. I can actually get quite far using traditional fluid mechanics uh, to describe cosmology, uh, at least if you're looking at structure formation. So I'm going to consider a universe that consists purely of dark matter, and this matter is spatially homogeneous and isotropic, so no preferred directions or positions. Uh, and this fluid is going to be expanding, and it's going to expand in such a way that the velocity of the fluid element is proportional to its distance from the observer, and the proportionality constant is the Hubble parameter, and this is what is now known as the hubble lemaitre law, or most, much of the 20th century this was just called the Hubble law, and so it was recently uncovered that Lemaitre had independently discovered this, and had his um, uh, work censored in a translation of this paper from uh, French into English. So the International Astronomical Union has recently um, voted to rename Hubble's law, the Hubble Lemaitre law. So I'm just putting that out there. Uh, the Hubble parameter is still called capital H. Okay, so our system has this very nice model. These are just the old navier Stokes systems. It's a self-gravitating fluid, a Poisson's equation. Uh, so there's Newtonian gravity here. 
row is the depth mass density of the dark matter. Here is its velocity, which is described by uh, over here. The pressure gradients, and we have bulk viscous pressures. Now, you might think that one has to use relativity in order to do cosmology. Um, however, this Newtonian treatment is an incredibly good approximation for non relativistic matter, like dark matter, moving fairly slowly on scales below the horizon and many late times. If you're including radiation and neutrinos very early times, then you have to use full relativistic cosmology, and that's well known. Uh, but this is a very good agreement with observations. Okay, so the bulk viscous pressure usually obeys either is modelized by using the Eckhart theory or the Israel Stewart theory. Um, in the Israel Stewart theory, there's the finite relaxation time tau that's built in. In the Eckhart theory, systems relax instantaneously. So this tau is zero, and this means that if you have any any bulk viscous pressure pressure perturbations, they will travel infinitely fast. Okay, so we want to avoid that pathology by including a finite relaxation time. So we've used the Israel Stewart model. Uh, for our problem. Okay, now we perform the standard genes analysis, so we serve and linearize our system. I'm not going to go into the details, but um, quite technical. Uh, the point is, one ends up with an evolution equation for these density perturbations, delta, and that's a fractional change in the density. Okay, these dots are essentially time derivatives. So this looks like the old sheets of stability, um, where there's a viscous pressure source. And in the absence of any viscosity, we recover the standard evolution equation for density perturbations in cosmology. Okay? And that is very much like the old genes of stability. Uh, if I don't have any expansion, then the Hubble parameter vanishes. So I just have a delta double dot and a delta. So that looks like the equation of simple harmonic motion, so you'd expect uh, sinusoidal solutions. However, your uh, coefficient delta will change sign depending on the on the wavelength you're looking at, on the wave number, k. And so where this term in brackets vanishes, that gives us the genes and stability criteria. Um, so your system goes from having waves that just oscillate to waves that grow exponentially. When the waves are growing exponentially, that's when the instability sets in, and that's when large scale structure falls. That's built in here. That's the old heat stability. Uh, what the expansion of the universe does is add this term here, which is an effective friction term, uh, which tends to dilute things. Okay, so that's essentially the physics behind equation twenty eight. Uh, and when we included the Israel Stewart viscosity. We derived an evolution equation that is equivalent to 28, uh, and I've written it down symbolically here. If you want to see the equation in its full glory, uh, please refer to equation 16 of our paper. Uh, they're very lengthy expressions, which we determined analytically. Uh, I'm not going to put them up here. They don't fit in the slide. You're not going to gain anything by, by looking at the exact form. Uh, what you should take home is that the evolution equation is now third order. So having a transport equation for the bulk viscosity uh, introduces entry modes, and so we now have a, a third order in time evolution equation. And we analyze this numerically. And I'll give you an example of one of our uh, plots. So here is a plot of the density contrast delta as a function of the scale factor, which you can pick up as a time variable. So, solving this equation for delta as a function of time. So, that's near the beginning of the universe. This is the universe today. So, the scale factor is normalized from 0 to 1. And I don't know how clearly you can see this. Uh, so, we've done a number of little plots here. There's the standard cold dark matter scenario where there's no viscosity. And that is this, dash, is this line here. That's the Orlando CDM model, standard model of cosmology. You see, there the density contrast is much bigger compared to the other situations. All these models have this built in. So, using a purely linear analysis, um, 
the Lambda CDA model predicts much more clustering uh, than models of viscous dark matter. Uh, the Eckhart model is this line here that produces the least amount of clustering. What we looked at were the Israel Stewart or the truncated Israel Stewart models. And here we allowed our, our relaxation times or equivalently our bulk viscous speeds to vary. And these are these red, blue, and green lines. And so we can actually capture a wide range of behavior here. So in the small scale crisis, you've got far too much structure on the much smaller scales. Uh, and this is just a plot for a bit specific wave number K. And so what we've demonstrated is that including causal bulk viscosity can suppress the growth of structure. Uh, and this will show up. Uh, there are equivalent plots in our papers, various scales. So we've motivated why our bulk viscosity could be important in histology and how it could help address these structure formation problems. Okay, so that's just an example of how um, viscous hydrogen numbers can be used. And you can see we've used a purely uh, Newtonian treatment. Yeah. Okay, I just want to conclude and talk about some of these results. Uh, the take home message is that viscosity suppresses the growth of structures in the systems with the gravitational instability. Uh, this can be applied to cosmology, various problems in structure formation, uh, such as the missing satellites and core cusp problems. Uh, what we did find, and what I haven't shown, is that there were some parameters and values where the clustering tended to increase, uh, and we're not quite sure why that happens. We suspect that the model might be breaking down. We could be violating the signal of the dynamics somewhere, uh, but there's certainly uh, this very strange behavior. We expect dissipation to smooth things out and not to make them more uh, more clustered. So that's an area we, we tend to look at. Um, further developments include look at the non-linear stages. This is a purely linear treatment. Uh, there's lots of observational work to be done relating what astronomers see. <laughs> to our model parameters. And of course, this can also be extended to a full relativistic field, where we'd expect these results to survive in a limiting case. OK, so that's essentially the main uh, result of, uh, of this work. And I'd like to go on to state a couple of references. These are some key papers. Uh, I can leave this up if anyone's interested in. Um, Anyone wanting to learn anything about fluid mechanics has looked at Lander and Lipschitz. This is the, uh, the main tome. Uh, uh, there's an excellent book on viscous fluid dynamics by Frank White. Uh, a couple of more recent editions. Uh, this is a fairly nice book that I recently discovered by Lartrup. If you want to look at relativistic hydrodynamics, uh, there's an excellent book by Rizzola and Sonati, which contains lots of the uh, lots of the material on the dissipative hydrodynamics that I've showed here. Um, so like the Eckhart and the Israel Stewart theory. Uh, I've listed their main papers here, as well as Disconzi's recent paper, um, as well as my recent work on the uh, use of bulk viscosity and structural information. Uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to uh, tell you a bit about who we are, and in fact, Quite glad that everyone uh, in the group is in this room because they're going to appear on the next slide. <laughs> uh, this is what the maths department at Rhodes looks like. We've got these uh, nice trees in the, in the background. Um, um, the relativity and cosmology group at Rhodes consists of Professor Bishop, Professor Polney, Dr. Stevens, and myself. Uh, we're located behind various windows here. Uh, the group largely works in numerical relativity gravitational waves, binary black holes. Um, I'm the non-numerical relativist in the group, so the stuff I do was the subject of this talk, as well as accretion, uh, which we've looked at in modified gravity with uh, Chris Stevens and I have recently done some work on this. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support of Rhodes University and the UTDP program. And if you're interested in any of this sort of work or have any questions about um, relativity in general, uh, feel free to contact any of us. Um, here's my email address and my web page. Uh, gone slightly over time, uh, but thank you for your attention.